Okay, so back to the main British Mark V tank from World War One. Now, uh, I had started this build uh, <laughs> maybe almost a year ago, um, and you know, I if you've been watching the channel, I did uh, the first episode of the build, and as you can see here, I have. Uh, some of the things that I worked on back then, which was primarily the wheels, the engine, and building the two uh, side Sponson uh, gun emplacements. So, but at that point, I then went and did some priming, as you can see from the gray. And uh, <laughs> I don't know, you know, I I, I was looking, I, I believe, at the uh, AMT uh, Coca-Cola monster truck, and I was like, you know what, I want to build that. So I built that. And then one thing led to another, one kit, another kit, another kit, and um, here we go, uh, almost a year later. So, I will say first, you know, when, you, when you're when doing this this hobby and, and you know, building these models, um, one of the things to me that says hobby, <laughs> or in its definition, is, you know, you do things when you want to do them. There's no deadline, there's no requirement, there's, no. And certainly for the uh, time and effort it takes to do a build and do it to the point where you're satisfied with it, you know, it's all supposed to be fun and you're supposed to feel good about what you do when you're finished with it. Um, I, for one, I, I don't want to feel any pressure to get myself my stuff done or, you know, get myself motivated to do a build. No, when I, when I feel that I want to do the build, I, I do a build. Uh, if I'm not into what I'm doing at the moment or I, I go on to something else, you know, sometimes when I'm debating what kit I will do next, I, I take a kit down, I look at it and thinking that this is going to be the one that I'll do. And then, you know, I let it sit for a few days. And when I come back down to, to get started, I think, is, is this in fact what I want to do? And sometimes I, I change my mind. I'm like, no, you know what? I'd, I'd rather do this one or that one, whatever the case may be. So um, the point of, of this little spiel is, you know, remember it's a hobby. You do what you want to do. Uh, you're, you're never going to be satisfied with your end result of a build if you're not excited and invested to do it. So, because let's face it, it, it is a significant amount of time you, you sit and build. Yes, some people build way faster than others. I've said many times, I I feel like I'm on the uh, slower side of the scale. That w Whatever that means, it's meaningless to me. I, I build in the time it takes me to build. Uh, but in any case, wherever you, you sit on that, that scale, you know, it is a time commitment. And if you're really not uh, focused and, you know, internally excited and committed to doing the build at hand, it's just going to feel like work. And, um, well, we all have enough work in our lives, don't we? This is supposed to be fun. So that concludes today's lecture. <laughs> and let's get back to the uh, Meng British World War One tank. Now, uh, sort of just a closing on um, the, the, the blab I was on there. I actually filmed a um, part more, uh, a first intro to the second episode of the build. And, um, you know, that sat on my computer all the time since. So I'm redoing it for today. And uh, what is going to happen here, what I'm going to do. So I had mentioned before my plan. This is the floor of the tank. This is going to be the driver's side sponsor. And that's the interior. The floor of the tank will sit like so. You can see they have these nice little indicator marks where that attaches. I'm going to build a base and make it so that the floor of the base swings open and an access point to the rear of the tank, which means that when it opens, because of geometry, the whole side will swing away. So there should be a nice open view inside there. And I'm figuring if I put the tank at about a 45 degree angle and I can open this up to a right angle, this will also give me a good indication as to the size of the base I need to build. So what I am going to do is first I'm going to 
work on the floor and at the same time the uh, I'm sorry the driver's side sponsor will be fixed the passenger side sponsor will be the one opening and uh, get that built up I'm also considering because they do give you some detail on the drive mechanism oddly enough this thing was propelled by a chain drive transmission which uh, <laughs> you know I, I find that fascinating because uh, the way technology is applied sometimes uh, typically a technology is developed it will be pushed to its extreme and then a new technology will come along and replace it so here we have a technology that's basically derived from bicycles you turn a drive gear on a bicycle by foot it drives a chain to your final drive outlet which would be the rear wheel on the bike and you know the natural progression of technology was just to add an engine and drive a bigger thicker chain <laughs> in a, a bigger heavier vehicle so you know until they really reached the limit of what you could do with the chain and you know blah 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 so there we go uh so that is going to be the plan as i build up the driver's side sponson that will certainly give me better indication as to what i can do here and you know this will go to the outer side of the hull which would be this side so that goes together like so and yeah that drive mechanism will sit in there the sponson coupler then sits into the outside of the whole light so and that there's all sorts of plates and stuff to you know cover this up so that should look pretty good when it's swung out and obviously there's a lot of detail painting to be done here which I look forward to I already have my airbrush charging because this is definitely a build where the airbrush will come in handy uh, doing all this interior painting so with all that said I'm gonna get to it Okay, so here we are after doing some building. Now, I will say right off the bat, and as you may have noticed in some of the uh, the, the, the pictures I did of the uh, buildup, you know, wow, detail, detail. Now, some of it, such as this whole, uh, I'm assuming that's like a clutch assembly in there, uh, will be lost to view. It will be buried inside because the outer armor plate will go on like so and you won't see it there and inside you have the there we go there we go and inside you have the cover of the where the transmission will go in so that will set up like so and then the gun case will mount to the outside like that and that is how it builds up the chain drive will be exposed now one of the big things i wanted to do with this and getting this assembly together of course because of the way i'm going to build it with one side of the tank opening up uh, it was really important for me to see how this structure goes together. It The fit is fantastic. These pieces, they just have these small tabs, but man, everything is spot on and it, it basically self-aligns what minor gaps there are as you build it. Uh, really precise. Happy to see. Also, happy to say uh, snow report, you know, in terms of cleaning up parts. Uh, no snow skies are clear <laughs> the uh, the only cleanup I really had to do was just the nub marks and you know 
that's that's always going to be uh, the situation. But I have the wheels on, and in building this, what I wanted to see in terms of how I plan on doing my final presentation of the kit, I have to figure out a way to mount the opening side to the base since that is going to swing away from the tank. This has to stand securely on its own. And what I saw here were two locations where I could come in with, well, actually a couple locations where I could come in with posts to mount it to the base. So I would drill up, mount, and I'll probably just use a piece of spare sprue from the kit um, and then drill into the base and seat this down and epoxy it in and that'll be it. It won't go anywhere. Uh, as far as this clutch assembly, I had mentioned, you know, doing a cutaway view. Problem though is if I'm going to have my mounting rods in there for the base, to the base, uh, I'm not going to want this to be open. And also, uh, cutting it away, I'm not quite sure how much benefit that will provide to see the inner workings here. So what I will probably do is build this clutch pack and then paint it all up, but have leave it out of the other sponson and just have it freestanding on the kit. Uh, if you watched my build of the Ryefield Panther, I did this with a couple of elements from that tank where I made a little display stand, had them sitting outside uh, so you could see that detail without it being lost in the kit. But the other important thing here is having now assembled this, really get to appreciate how to do the painting because there is a channel molded here for the fitting of the tank interior. And that runs right along here and in the floor along here, the back plate here, and then of course the roof across the top which means everything inside those borders will be white and everything outside those borders will be the brown of the uh, finished tank color. And of course, this too will be white on its interior. Now, when we put this together, you can actually build this with all the running gear loose so that it rolls. I glued mine in place because I didn't want the wheels falling off while I was experimenting with how things go together. Also, even though you have this really nice detail of the final drive assembly, the track is going to lay right over it and you are never going to see it again. Because for that classic rhomboidal shape of the tank, uh, the track just wraps around like so. And that will be that. You know, it is a kit, and sometimes I've noticed this with the, these interior detail kits. Um, when you see, you know, other people building them, inevitably there are some details of the kit that you build that are lost, and uh, basically um, you'd have to get really inventive <laughs> and really have to do a lot of work with the kit to leave those visible. So I'm going to make some concessions here, as you would on any kind of these builds. So this will be left outside on the other sponson to be detailed so I could do my mounting post. This I'm not going to worry about. The track will wrap around it. That's just going to be lost. The chain is visible from inside the tank, although there is a big cooling unit that fits over this side. So this side will not be seen, but on the other side it will. And then the rest will just be detail painting. Now the other thing this allows me to do, I'll put this side back on, you know, I'm going to install lighting in here so that it's easier to see everything since the tank is rather cramped inside. So by having built up this sponson, I can already see that I can run um, probably a little piece of tube across the roof and then in here and have a light in here to light all of this up. Uh, probably have two lights for the interior to light them up. And uh, that, that should do a pretty good job of illuminating to show the detail.
Okay, so I've been doing some painting, so I thought I would step in and show you a little bit of um, an approach to airbrushing, I guess. Now, you could get as many tips as there are people using airbrushes off of YouTube. <laughs> there are a lot of people who, um, you know, really expert at using an airbrush. I am not. Uh, there are people who are very knowledgeable about all the techniques and different ways you can approach airbrushing. Um, I'm not one of those either. So, <laughs> you know, I use my airbrush for just a few things. And typically it is on these um, military type builds. In fact, I bought the airbrush I have for the uh, Panther um, Ryfield models uh, Panther tank that I did with the cutaway with all the interior. So I'm just going to go over a little bit of that because I did talk about the airbrush uh, pros and cons, uh, at least for someone new to using one like me uh, in that video. But I'm just going to go over that quickly. So first thing I will say is uh, remember to prime your parts. <laughs> so I was so eager to get in and because I've done, as you've seen from the pictures, I've done quite a bit of assembly at this point. And now I'm at a stage where I really need to start painting before I can move forward with any more assembly. Because at this point, assembling and not painting would just make the painting more tricky trying to get into areas that are not quite so accessible or ridiculous masking jobs. So I'm trying to evaluate my steps to keep things as easier in their individual parts moving forward, uh, individual phases moving forward, rather than trying to lump too much together and say, I'm gonna do a whole bunch of building, and now I'm gonna do a whole bunch of painting and create a real headache in terms of masking and trying to get in. So um, that's my approach to building. Uh, it is different for other people. Uh, certainly what I am doing here may seem overall to be uh, less efficient, if uh, efficiency is something you're really looking for in your build. Um, because I will be doing my painting in certain stages um, rather than just knocking it all off at once. But whatever, to each their own. So first part, as I just went off on a tangent there, the importance of priming. So it's really important you prime your parts before you airbrush them because the airbrush is going to put down a very thin coat of paint. And to show you the difference, here is a perfect example. So here was a bulkhead. This is the rear bulkhead actually. I primed and the inside I had also primed, but this is after just two coats of paint. And you can see this is uh, basically done. I, I have a nice white coat on that. As opposed to the engine cover, which I forgot to prime and just started painting it. And I wondered, why is my paint going on uh, not so great? And then I realized, uh, moron, <laughs> you forgot to prime. But after two coats, you can see this still looks very spotty. So... And these are some whole plates. These are two coats. These are taking it a little bit better after forgetting to prime because they're, they're just flat surfaces, whereas this has all of these contours. But do, do remember to prime. Now, for primer, I just used uh, Tamiya Mr. Uh, Surface Primer. Just sprayed that on. That goes on super fine. So I don't worry about gunking up my parts with... Uh, primer. So you can see here, I didn't even go crazy trying to do a 100% coverage. I just wanted to get most of this piece with the primer on it. And this way I know the white will then adhere pretty well. And then I can go in and do my detail painting. And to give you an idea of, uh, do you have to build it first and then prime? No, you do not. Um, here, this is the other large bore gun that sits on the other sponson. Here I uh, primed all the parts first and then I'll assemble. And to give you an idea of how fine the coat of paint is, oh, something stuck on there. So the sprue is originally this beige color and I marked in the letter 
and with a black marker so that I could pick it out easy from the box. And you can see the primer gray basically covered up this tan quite well, but barely covered up the black. So it is a thin coat and over the tan plastic covers it just fine. And then likewise, the comparison between, um, you know, airbrushing over the primer versus not on the uh, bare plastic. Um, and really, this is the color saturation I am shooting for, which is, it's a nice white. And it these are Tammy acrylics I've been using. So, you know, they <laughs> you kind of can't go wrong with them. They, they just come out beautiful. Um, but I wanted the gray undercoat because you do end up with some very slight shadow effects around all of these rivets and all this wonderful detail down here up into the uh, couple of bays. So that's nice stuff. And that's the effect I'm looking for. Even though I'm building as like a vehicle would be displayed in a museum. So I'm not going to weather it and beat it all up. I'm not interested in doing any of that stuff. Um, I do want the definition and the detail in the part highlighted. So that is there and I am happy with that. Now you will also see on uh, other channels, people go at length when they uh, airbrush playing with the pressure on the brush, with the mix of paint they use, you know, uh, thinner to the paint itself. And like, again, they, some people really get into it and, you know, the paint jobs look incredible when they're done. Um, I like to keep things simple. <laughs> so what I do, so here's uh, some acrylic paint thinner and acrylic paint. Of course, this is the white I've been using. I've experimented with different ratios and I have found two parts paint to one part thinner. Done. <laughs> and it's worked just fine for me. And that's what I've used to do all the painting that you see here and that I will then do later on the exterior of the kit. Now, that dilution, being what it is, is what's working well for my paintbrush setup, which I'm going to pull out here. Now, I believe I showed this when I was doing the uh, rye field tank, but I just thought I would show it again because I just find this to be such a neat and workable uh, solution. So this is the uh, Maker X. Um, it's really for uh, delicate hobby tools, the Maker X series from uh, Works Tools. So you get, which is basically, I'm trying to do this with one hand. So this is basically an uh, electric tool battery from Wartz. And then you get this little controller unit, which delivers your power. This is the compressor for the brush. So I'll fire this up. And there you go. Now you notice with this, there is a min-max knob. But as you can tell from the sound, it doesn't matter. The pressure you're getting is the pressure you're getting. I don't know what that pressure is. Uh, I don't care what that pressure is <laughs> because I have set up my dilution. Everything works with this. So I really enjoy this because it's simple. <laughs> I plug it in. It is what it is. And I go from there. Boom. Uh, the airbrush itself is a dual action. So pressure on off and then paint dispense. You pull back. It does come apart like a standard airbrush, which was the other thing I liked about this when I saw it is that you're not buying something that is proprietary. All the parts in here work with their standard airbrush parts, the needle, all of this stuff. So if you need to replace things, it's not a problem. And this whole rig, and it came with a little rotary tool, I think cost me about $100, which, okay, yes, it is $100. But if you go looking at you know, like serious airbrushes, the brush itself could be, uh, you know, well in excess of that, the compressor well in excess of that. And then you're going to have a big honking compressor. This I find very easy to use. I just hold it like this, fire it up and 
do my spraying. So, and the cleanup is simple enough. Uh, these caps come off, the paint cup comes off, and it exposes the tip of the needle. I just run a whole bunch of the thinner through it to blow it out, and I go into the swab, clean everything up. So, I'm not a fan of having to do the cleanup, but if you're going to use an airbrush, any kind of airbrush cleanup is very important because over time, if you do not clean it properly, paint will gunk up in there and it's just not going to work well for you anymore. It's just going to make a mess. So that is that. And when I actually use it, you know, the paintbrush in a way, it's the hobby maniacs out there are going to jump out a window when I say this, but <laughs> I look at it as it's not much different than using, you know, a rattle can. You're going to start spraying your paint and you just want to keep moving. You got to keep moving. You don't want to sit still because then it's the paint's just going to pile up and you'll get a mess. And just like a spray can, it is better to do successive light coats than one thick coat. First of all, the thick coat is going to clog up the detail on your parts. You won't be able to appreciate that. And if you put a lot of paint on there, it's going to pool. You're going to get runs. It's going to look, it's going to look bad. If you go with several light coats, you can, one, avoid that mess. Two, as you're doing your coats, you can check your parts afterwards and make sure, okay, I, I still have all my t detail. And while looking at it, you can decide, well, you know what? I think... The shadow that I'm still getting on the parts from the primer coat underneath is what I want. This is good. Done. And simple. You know, when using a spray can, even, <clears throat> you know, rattle can paint, even if you're, you know, spraying at a relatively short distance, it's a little bit harder to appreciate that detail. Uh, and since I'm using acrylics, I don't have toxic fumes and nonsense going on here. But you do need to protect your work area. That's why I lay out the towels so you don't end up with a mess. So, with all of that said, I will now get back to it and start doing some more assembly. The hinges and the support post, I will save that discussion until later when I have a little bit more of the vehicle together because then it will really become apparent why I did those things. But that is part of forward thinking. <laughs> and I'll explain that later. All right, so back to it. Okay, so obviously been doing building. I haven't been able to do any building on camera because I have found this to be a very delicate assembly, which means it wasn't really comfortable to do it on camera because I guess I'm simply not that dexterous. But I wanted to stop here because I wanted to point out it's really, it's a fascinating build. <laughs> and uh, what I'm going to show is kind of like what I did when I built the uh, Ryefield uh, Panther with the full interior, is that if you have a curiosity about how a vehicle like this worked, or just, you know, mechanical curiosity, in assembling this, you get to see how everything worked. And it's, it's just, it's... It's just fascinating. <laughs> uh, caught, caught me for a lack of words here. Uh, obviously, it's very educational in that regard. But I just wanted to point out some of the detail you get with this. So this is our engine, our drive carriage, so to speak, which has the engine, the clutch, the main drive clutch, and the uh, transaxle in the rear and what you see here are all these rods along the side. These are the rod linkages that they would use to engage the clutches for either side of the track. Um, you know, it's, that's just so cool to see that. There are, which I'll show you in a moment, there are some more levers to attach to these linkages. We have up front these drive belts, which go to these drive lines. One of them goes all the way back here. You can follow it through and it comes out the back 
and that will drive the fan in the giant blower assembly in the back. There's another one that comes across. This belt will go up and it attaches to a hand crank so you can see if they needed to manually, uh, well they manually started, but when they manually started the motor, they cranked the hand crank, which is not in there yet, which drove the belt, which drove this shaft, which tied to this belt and went into the crankcase so you could see how they manually turned over the motor and I just think that's that's so neat you know it is a delicate assembly which I'll talk about in a moment but you can see all the detail on here is is just beautiful and you know I didn't go crazy with weathering because as I've said I'm meaning to build this as if it was on display in a museum certainly since I'm going to be do the opening hull but now here is this little front assembly which sits on top like so when it's assembled but here we have the two the driver's seat this will be the commander seat but for the driver's seat we have the pull levers for the transmission we have I assume these are to actually engage the tracks um, you know but all that linkage is there it all connects to the linkage on the motor carriage itself so that's you know really giving you an insight as to how this thing worked and what these operators inside the tank crew you know inside the vehicle what they had to deal with to try to manage this thing and looking at this you, know, you got two push rods you've got two actually I think those are hand brakes and then there will be two foot levers here so that driver literally had his hands full now perhaps the bigger question here after all of that really neat stuff is well how well does it assemble it assembles very well and I was really impressed where some of these parts are very small very delicate have tiny locator marks or pinouts but you know what everything goes in and more importantly the stuff lines up which is pretty impressive especially here where we have these long linkage bars you know if these aren't molded straight and true forget it nothing's going to fit but this is two separate pieces they attach together they attach to two points they line up with this rear frame member. They go in straight. I mean, you can't ask for better than that. So, really good. The only issue I had with assembly is that in some parts of the instructions, they tell you to do things in an order where you, you have a part hanging out in space. For example, the transaxle here, when you assemble this, it's actually only going to sit on one little attachment point here otherwise it's flapping in the breeze this part this rear frame member doesn't go in until later I put mine in because that has the other two attachment points for the axle and without that you're not going to potentially seat it correctly same here for this assembly with the hand crank I put these two frame members in and put the wooden uh, top plate on there so that everything lined up and I could true it uh, I painted these red because when the side of the tank opens, these would actually mate into the uh, drive assemblies within the whole uh, track side, the sponson, so that's going to be open. So I'm just putting red there to indicate where that would be a, a cut, so to speak. Uh, if you're curious how I did some of the painting for uh, my approach to this, as with everything I like to do, I love simplicity so uh, I like to get this this wood look on this step here it's a nicely molded piece you know it's got the slats and everything so what I did I just primed it with black I painted it with a uh, testers rust um, I'm sorry a testers uh, brown it goes on there it doesn't really cover well but I thought you know what that gives a nice tone variation as you would have with wood and then after that dried, 
I just went over the whole thing with um, a Tamiya brown panel liner to give it a little more color variation and that was it so no special technique there it's actually just what you, you might say I did a poor cover coat but it gave me tones from the black uh, primer underneath that I wanted and that was that same too for the step area on either side of the cradle that was um, you know it was a white primer underneath the same as the rest of the chassis I just went over that with some uh, Tamiya NATO Brown and then I did some black panel liner to highlight the gaps in the steps uh, elsewhere on the engine I did go on with black panel liner and just did around bolts and places where things would meet and you know lubricant would uh, potentially seep on springs and whatnot again I didn't go heavy with it because I am building something that would have been or you know in my little imaginary world is sitting in a museum for display um, obviously I have to do some touch-up painting on these parts but once that sits in there vaguely like so you know you'll get an idea how this uh, will look so Last thing I wanted to point out, there is a big engine cover which sits over and they do give you the side doors to cover up the engine. Now, um, this is actually one molded piece which is really beautiful, but I'm actually going to uh, cut some area out of this and give a little more view of the engine because with this on, and it needs to go on because the hand crank goes on here. There's a belt that attaches. There's a number of things that uh, have to attach to this engine covering that uh, without it in place becomes problematic. So my solution is I'm going to cut that out and um, give a little more viewing room. But I didn't want to cover up the engine in here because this is uh, just a really beautiful assembly. And um, even with what I would consider you know a fairly simple paint job um there's there's so much detail and it, it really looks sharp so that's all i have to say for now gonna get back to it and i will probably be back with a little more live action uh you know post assembly rather than trying to film assembly because uh it is delicate it is finicky if you do not have tweezers and you try to build this kit, keep it in the box to get yourself a good set of tweezers um, because you absolutely will need them putting some of these pieces in. Uh, some of the assembly spaces get rather tight. Putting in these linkages uh, was a little bit of a finesse job, especially the ones that went inside along here. Uh, as you can see with all these parts, it is a fairly crowded assembly and you do have to get in there and work in that space and there is no way uh even a tiny little human hand could get in there to do what you need to do so definitely gonna need tweezers if you take a crack at this kit but um as long as you have a good hold on them and you know you test fit to figure out how you need to get the piece in there like i said everything lines up things pop into place there's some things here I didn't even glue. They just press fitted because the fit was so good. Um, and that's, boy, that's that's a real compliment to the design and accuracy of the parts. So that said, going to move on and uh, into the next phase. All righty. Okay, so back, been doing some painting. But first, let's take a look at that engine cradle. All right, and here we go. Now that is a very cool, very detailed assembly. And I'm really happy, really happy <laughs> the way that came out. Uh, the red lines, those are the detail for the cut line. That's all parts of that shroud that I removed so that we can still see the engine and all its beautiful detail once the assembly is done. Um, you know, it was kind of a shame because that piece, 
the molding that that was all molded in one piece was was pretty pretty wild to look at but uh, it just wasn't working for what I wanted in the final appearance of the kit to be able to see all that engine detail so I had to give it the snip but now it's done all the detail painting is done you can see that final hand crank that was used to manually turn over the engine to get it started which is still <laughs> it seems like a, a crazy thing to consider okay that's that now what I did come in to talk about right now is painting the body so you'll say oh the tank is made out of chocolate uh, <laughs> as tasty as that might be no what I did I used this uh, Tamiya NATO Brown this XF 68 is a base coat uh, and I'm going to go over that now with my Tamiya XF 52 flat earth which is then going to be the base color of the tank that's what I'm looking for so you can see it's kind of like a muddy brown not quite the color they're showing in the printout uh, I don't care <laughs> I think that's a good enough color uh, and I don't want it so dark um, you know for having a lot of detail on the kit if the color is too dark the detail is going to be lost and then what's the point right so I'm uh, gonna go with this a little bit of a lighter brown still has a very earthy muddy color which is what they went for on these vehicles being that it was a World War one in the trench area everything was covered with mud tanks horses people everything so there we go the idea of using the dark brown first is now when I spray the lighter brown over then I will get my uh, shadow effect, so to say, uh, around the bolts and this and that without having to go and try to use a wash or anything like that. Hopefully that will be in place for myself now as well. Um, as far as prepping for this, it's hard to see now because it's got the brown paint on it, but I did mask over the lid for the driver's compartment and for the commander's cupola because those will need to be painted white and red and I don't want to try painting white over dark brown that won't be fun likewise for the sides of the track runs I masked over all the white that I did before so I could just do the brown up front here again it's hard to see this is where this detail is going to be for the um, white and red stripes so i have that masked over and then i'll peel that tape off once it's done so i'll be back to gray primer then i can do the white and then the red stripe so that's where it's going gonna get to do that paint and then i'll be back i just wanted to show you this because it's nothing fancy it's just basic using tape to mask over what I don't want to have painted and then coming in with the airbrush and doing the work and as usual I just used a very simple approach one part acrylic paint thinner two parts paint it doesn't have to be a scientific measurement and it works out just fine alrighty back to it All right, so now after the painting, here we go. We have our brown, very muddy. It is difficult to see on camera, but I do have some of the shading I wanted. It is minimal. Again, I am building something that I'm looking at as sitting in a museum, not, uh, you know, cruising around the battlefield, so no mud no rust none of, the, none of that kind of stuff i just wanted a little bit of shadow for definition now you will notice up front it's just gray that is where i will have to do the painting the white and the red uh, you'll notice that also on the roof section here now looking at it you know i had some overspray no tragedy no big deal i gotta do this in white anyway so 
that will be cleaned up. You see in here a little bit. Um, you know, I don't I don't claim to be a skilled airbrusher by any means, and um, <laughs> I, I may be the worst airbrusher on uh, in the hobby. But you know what? I don't care <laughs> because it's good enough for what I am looking to do. And um, yeah, it is going along just fine. So gonna stop here again and I'm gonna get that white done and the touch-ups and do the red stripe to do that I'm going to because I want the red on white because I'll make the red you know sharper than being on gray and certainly on you know the brown which isn't there but I will paint this whole section white and then I'll mark off and add the red in uh, and there we go same with the roof I'll do the white and then mark off and leave a exposed band down the middle and spray in my red and take it from there. Alrighty. Okay, so here we are going to be wrapping up episode two of this build. And things are really starting to shape up. So uh, what I thought I would do for the end of this episode is just kind of lay out what I have at this point and uh, fill you in a little bit what the plan is and then you can see uh, some of the progress too. I, I Instead of doing things together, I did things a little bit differently so you could see um, you know, the progression of the assembly without me actually going through the assembly because I find this is... Uh, getting into way much uh, um, a lot more time than I had originally thought it would but that's not a criticism to the kit uh, that is entirely I would say uh, due to my approach to the kit one because of the way that I am modifying it for display two and actually the first thing I want to talk about here is a painting strategy and I have to say, at this point of the build, I, I think I made every mistake I could have made in terms of figuring out my painting strategy. Um, as you saw in earlier parts of the video, I did do quite a bit of assembly before painting, with the idea being that this should make it a little bit easier. However, even though in the painting guide, it shows you plain as day, the red and white on the a couple of roofs. I built it thinking, well, it's all going to be one color anyway. And afterwards doing uh, the masking for this turned out to be uh, quite a challenge. And I masked and painted and found that I had left a big gap in my masking and had a giant mess, which required uh, quite a bit of cleanup. And uh, yeah, uh, a lot of time and work that I only had to invest because of my carelessness. So there you go. At this point, I would say in terms of the kit itself, it goes together beautifully, you know, no issues. Uh, when I was showing off the highlight of this incredible engine carriage assembly, you know, I, I still, <laughs> I still love looking at this as I'm working on the rest of it because it, it is such a, a neat thing that they, they did here in engineering the kit. The way this goes together, the way it all looks when it's done, it, it's just such a neat assembly. There's, there's so much detail, and it just goes together so well for all the little parts, and everything is keyed, and it's just, can't, can't say enough about it. The sponsons I showed the, the track runs assembling them. Now this one, this is going to be the side of the tank that opens up. That's why I painted the red breakaway breakaway line. There's still some touch-up painting I need to do, but really there is no further assembly here. Its gun emplacement is over here. This is just the very basic paint and the uh, brass for the backs of the shells, the large bore that goes in there. But more importantly, 
and I'll just flip that shut because that is a door I added on. And my son is making wacky faces so <laughs> while I'm trying to film. Hey, you want to be on camera, Patrick? Sure. <laughs> All right. Let me uh, let me pan up here. Here we go. Give the couple of viewers a break Ooh. from uh, car models and see my handsome face. I there think. we go. <laughs> <laughs> All right. That's my younger son, Mr. Patrick. Now an internet sensation. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. As they say in Monty Python, and now for something completely different. But uh, back to the build. So what I was doing here and what I wanted to show you, uh, again, modifications I made. This top plate for the gun emplacement is supposed to be glued in. I made yet another hinge and put that on there. So this way when it's assembled, you can look right in there and get a really nice view of that gun. And also, you can see my hand through there into the interior of the tank. And then inside, this is what you get to see in terms of detail. And it is really a neat thing to look at. So, as usual, I did take uh, my own personal interpretation of some of the painting scheme. Um, but that's just what I wanted to do. This is left rough in terms of paint because this big blower assembly will cover that up. But now you can see, as opposed to the building in, well, with paint, it's not a building rough because it is painted. But once this is all together, how nice that looks in there. Yes, the gun does swivel on its mount and very freely, which is nice because now we don't have to worry about scratching the paint. Um, and then you can see the underside of the hinge I made there. Nothing complicated there. Just uh, as I showed with the other hinges I made, just bending some um, music wire and then using some uh, stock styrene to get in there and make the hinge receiver. So there we go with that. The track actually was a little tricky getting onto the run because it does fit in there quite tightly, especially along the bottom of the run. So even though you can build it with all the wheels rotating and all the drive wheels loose, uh, once the track is on, I don't really see how well it's going to move because it's in there. I just glued it, tack glued it in a few spots because the track segments had snapped loose from each other and I wanted to keep them in place. So that is that. And also to show you in terms of hinges, I made the two hinges for the top two. And of course, talking about making extra work, this was all extra that I did. And it is so that once this baby is all assembled and in display, there are more ways to look in there. But you'll see how that all goes together in episode three so what's going to happen in episode three well i'm going to go over how i build the base for this these will then come into play for holding into the base it will be permanently mounted to the base this is not something that can be picked up and moved and when it's all done you'll you'll see why as i mentioned i want a base that can fan open and already have a design for that so that will be coming along I also have to figure out uh, getting some lighting in here because I do want to light it up inside so none of this beautiful detail is lost. And together it goes. So that's where it's at. It's been a great build so far. Uh, again, certainly took a lot more time than I had anticipated, but that's because of the things I decided to do with it. If you wanted to build the kilt, build the kit straight out of the box you know aside from the painting and the paint detailing um i could have well been done with it but i don't look at this as a timed exercise so <laughs> uh, i am doing what i want to do and it looks like it should all come together well but we will find out in part three when i finish this machine up so that's it for now 
thank you for watching and sticking with me through this uh, journey on this one. And uh, if you're not already, please do consider subscribing, liking, sharing, all the good YouTube stuff, as I always like to say. And I will be back with part three, and we'll see this all done. So I'm hoping on this one to feel like I outdid myself because I'm starting to get that feeling, but we'll see how it goes in the final execution. Okay, so until then, thanks for watching and enjoy your hobby. Alrighty.